I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about centenafidine, a triple reuptake inhibitor that may be approved for ADHD. Would be the first triple reuptake inhibitor, and by that we mean norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin reuptake inhibitor approved for ADHD. It's being developed by Atsuka Pharmaceuticals, who makes Abilify and Rexulti. They do not have a brand name announced for it, so I'm going to keep calling it Centenafidine throughout this presentation. There have been already phase three studies published showing in adults that this drug, Centenafidine, is as effective for ADHD as other non stimulant approaches and appears to have substantially lower rates of almost every side effect compared to either the stimulants or the non-stimulants used to treat ADHD. Side effects that are showing up are headaches, dry mouth, insomnia, and nausea, but even at the higher doses, those all tend to be in the 5 or 6% range or less. First developed by Udymix Bioscience pre-2010, Atsuko bought out the company that bought out Udymix in 2017, so Atsuko, which is one of the larger pharmaceutical companies on the planet. Abilify, if you remember, was the number one money-making drug in the U.S. for almost all of the decade of the 2010s. And that's not just psychopharmacology drugs. That was all drugs pursuing indications for for depression. There was also even some preliminary research suggesting it might be helpful in cocaine abuse. Suntanafidine is what we call a triple reuptake inhibitor. So it's hitting the dopamine transporter, the norepinephrine transporter, the serotonin transporter, which is abbreviated CERT. In roughly equal strengths, many sources are referring it as a 1 to 6 to 14 relative strength. So it's strongest on norepinephrine and then secondarily on dopamine and serotonin are roughly equal. Some other reports have labeled it a 1 to 12 to 13 ratio. Don't get hung up on the particular precise numbers. Different assays, different tissue samples might have slightly different results. These are all both fairly close. The benefit of the serotonin is not thought to deal as much directly with ADHD itself, but maybe with concomitant depression or anxiety, although there's some researchers who think there is direct serotonin involvement in ADHD. One of the downsides of centenafidine is that it has a fairly short half-life. So the half-life of the compound itself is only five hours. The studies have involved an extended release formulation, but even the extended release formulation, in all the studies, they've been doing a twice-a-day dosing five hours apart, so early morning, midday, and that's almost certainly how the product if it gets approved, will be released. So the phase three study on um, lead author was Leonard Adler, who's a respected ADHD researcher at NYU. Two different phase three studies were combined into one report. More than 900 subjects were recruited for these studies. More than 45 different research sites were involved. So usually considered a strength of a study like this, that you're getting similar results from different sites where you are averaging out weaknesses or problems with small individual sites. Uncommonly for ADHD studies, this is almost equally balanced group of men and women, so about 52% men, 48% women. The study involved a one-week placebo group where they were washing out from any previous drugs, and assays were done at the beginning of the one week and at the end of that one week, and anyone who on the placebo showed a more than 30% improvement in their ADHD rating scale got thrown out. They were considered an excessive placebo responders. So at the end of one week washout, patients were randomly assigned into three equally sized groups. Placebo group, so they were ongoing placebo, 200 milligram centenafidine group, and that's a divided daily dose to get a total daily dose of 200, or a 400 milligram group. The 400 milligram group actually spent a week at 200 before ramping up to 400, so it wasn't too big a shock or too many side effects early on. And they were studied for six weeks of treatment, an observer-based ADHD rating scale based on the 
18 symptoms that the DSM-5 lists for ADHD, nine inattentive, nine hyperactive impulsive. And at week six, the final point of the study, 200 group to 400 group in study one, study two, somewhere in the 20 to 30% decrease in average group scores in the ADHD rating score. That's comparable to what other non-stimulant approaches to ADHD result in. Improvement was statistically meaningful by week four, and there was improvement in both inattentive and hyperactive impulsive symptoms, so it wasn't selecting one for the other. Now, what's particularly encouraging, we're seeing very little rates of side effects. So less than one or two percent of people, I think, in this study dropped out because of adverse effects. So I'm going to just run through five or six of the commonest side effects. I'm going to tell you first the placebo rate or the rate of the side effect in the placebo group in the 200 milligram group and the 400. Commonest side effect was decreased appetite in the placebo group, only one and a half, 1.7%, jumped up to 5.1% in the 200 milligram group and only 6.5%. So that's considerably more than the placebo, but not a huge percent, particularly for an ADHD med. Headaches, 2.4% in the placebo group, comparable 2.0% in the 200 milligram centenaphidine, but 4.5% in the 400 milligram dry mount was 0.3% placebo, 2.7% for 200, and 5.5% for the 400 milligram group. Nausea in those three groups went from 1.4%, 1.7 to 5.5 and insomnia also pretty similar low numbers two and a half percent in the placebo group and 2.7 in the 200 milligram dose but jumping up to four and a half one other thing they were concerned about is they looked at symptoms side effects that could be indicative of abuse potential and they included dizziness although dizziness and sleepiness are not usually side effects that people say, gosh, I want to try that. But they included dizziness, sleepiness, altered mood, feeling abnormal, and confusion. Placebo group had 3.4% endorsed one of those side effects, only 2% in the 200 milligram group, and only 3.8% in the 400 milligram group. The phase two studies, again, are a smaller size sample population usually checking a bigger range of dosages. The phase two studies, 500, 600, 800, did not seem to be more effective than 400, but there were more side effects as people increased above 400 milligrams. Also, and it was more marked in the phase two studies than the phase three studies, in the phase two studies, significant improvements in their ADHD rating score by the end of the first week, and that persisted through the six weeks of the phase two studies. If you actually look at the results from the phase three studies, we are seeing marked decrease in ADHD rating scores by the first week, but the placebo group also improved in the first week or two in the phase three studies. So that's why there is some statistically significant separation between placebo and treatment groups. They have not seen a dose dependent increase in blood pressure or in heart rate or an orthostatic blood pressure that changes in blood pressure when you change your posture, like dizziness when you stand up quickly. Any average change in blood pressure or heart rate were minimal and asymptomatic, a few isolated individuals in these phase two and three studies who did show elevated heart rate, elevated blood pressure. And yet those were isolated individuals and at a statistically meaningful level haven't jumped out can't be ruled out. So, so far, there are no direct head-to-head comparisons. These are all comparing centenaphidine to placebo, but Ann Childress and respected ADHD researcher and collaborators conducted or designed what's called a matching adjusted indirect comparison. So, they're taking from the literature studies of other treatments of ADHD. They try to match the study population same age, same degree of severity of ADHD symptoms. Others have validated this approach that it can be a meaningful approach to try to get results of what you're likely to see if you did a direct head-to-head comparison. Live answer this, that's amphetamine. 
They compared it to adamoxetine or Stotera, and they compared it to aloxazine or Kelbri. All of the side effects were substantially lower and substantial and statistically meaningful for the sentinaphidine compared to the thigh-dense group. So 23% less likelihood of appetite suppression, 19% lower rate of dry mouth, 15% lower rate of insomnia, 5% lower rates of anxiety and nausea, 3% rate lower rate of diarrhea and feeling jittery. So all the side effects they looked at were lower in the sentinaphidine. The benefits seem to be somewhat smaller, six points lower on the ADHD rating scale for sentinaphidine compared to Vyvanse, but they questioned how meaningful the difference that was given that both groups improved substantially compared to baseline. When they did this similar comparison to Stotera and Amoxetine, again, on every side effect that they looked at, the Sentanaphidine did better, and the benefits in terms of reduction in ADHD rating scores were the same, statistically meaninglessly different. 18% lower likelihood of nausea, 17% likelihood dry mouth, 9% less fatigue, Six or seven percent less erectile dysfunction, six point seven percent less appetite problems, five point eight percent less likelihood of urinary hesitancy. So it's doing better on all scores. Calbury, Veloxazine, it did better on every side effect they looked at, and it did comparably in terms of benefits. So eleven percent less fatigue, ten percent less insomnia, seven percent less nausea. 4.6% less constipation. To put some of that in perspective, we're looking at bigger numbers of people in bigger studies or these other drugs that have been out longer. Again, sentinaphidine is not yet approved. As a cautionary tale, there's another serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine reuptake inhibitor, so triple reuptake inhibitor, dasiltrolene. It's a metabolite of the antidepressant sertraline, there are a number of investigations and even some phase three studies looking at it for benefits in ADHD, where it did seem to have benefits. It did have substantially higher rates of side effects and discontinuation compared to sentinophidine. And in 2020, Synovian, which was developing it, decided to stop pursuing it for approval, and they sort of blandly said it just needed more studies than they had available to get approval. Side effects that were present with dasiltrolene were insomnia, decreased appetite, decreased weight, irritability, and non-serious psychotic symptoms, including hallucinations. So I think part of the worry was, was its dopamine reuptake action somehow contributing to these psychotic hallucinatory side effects, which could be a big problem. And other researchers have raised the question, do we really want to be looking at more dopamine reuptake actions, given that boosting, elevating dopamine does seem correlated in some ways with risk for addiction and risk for psychosis. Now, there are other studies with sentinaphidine, just do people like tasting it, do rats like tasting it, do monkeys like tasting it or not just tasting it, but response to the whole package that this drug delivers. And it seems to be an amorsive compound. So, so far, we're not seeing any strong indications that it has an addictive potential. The risk of psychosis is harder to identify in early stages of studies because it tends to be a rare outcome, even in drugs where it's early associated. This is not yet been approved. It's possible it may never be approved, and it's looking pretty encouraging, and it could be as soon as a few months from now that sentinaphidine is approved for ADHD in the USA. Stay healthy, stay healthy. Thanks for being here. 